Hello, everybody, and welcome to our session, which is Enterprise Cloud Offering Models and Service Strategies. So we're here today from Cisco IT to tell you about how we deploy our internal uh, OpenStack clouds for our internal applications. And really, if I had to sum up what we're trying to do, um, we're trying to complete the lean OpenStack machine. And this is our team's mantra. We're really passionate about it, and we've created the logo, as you can see here, and this is what we try and live by. We're going to go on and cover uh, about our different offering models and how we really deliver the lean OpenStack machine. So I'm Rob Douglas. Uh, I'm the OpenStack Program Manager and Product Owner for the Cisco IT Internal Clouds. And I'm Istvan Blasco. I'm a Business Operations Lead for the Data Center Compute Service at Cisco IT. Rob and I are in the same team. So let me introduce the agenda very quickly. Um, so as you see, this session is not very technical. This is more about how we define and deliver uh, the service within IT and how, how we execute on it and what it means for us. Um, so Rob is going to quickly introduce our OpenStack journey at Cisco, and then we are going to talk about different aspects of the service, starting from the operating model, the support offering, support and the cost models. So that's the gist of the presentation. And at the end, uh, we are going to talk about how it's packaged up uh, in, the right, for, in the right user experience for the clients, and we do a little bit of a demo of uh, our application-centric cloud, which I'll explain what it is. Thanks, Isvan. So I'm first of all going to cover the OpenStack uh, deployment within Cisco. Um, I thought a good place to start um, was when I first joined the compute service uh, in Cisco IT, uh, the first thing I did was uh, some training, some webinars, some internal documentation about our global cloud strategy. And that is the overall strategy for cloud computing from Cisco IT for internal use. Now, there was about 10 hours of training on that, lots of different webinars. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have that kind of time today, so I'm just going to give you a very brief uh, overview. So the first and most important trait is we, we're really focused on programmability now. We want automation, we want self-service, and we want speed of deployment. And we, we want this for our infrastructure and our applications. So for our applications, we're moving towards um, cloud-native uh, architectures as a big drive to get those applications developed using those traits. Um, with that, we get the benefit of software-defined intelligence, so we can really take humans out of the loop. Uh, we want to get away from IT being a bottleneck, having to do manual things that people get very frustrated because they have to wait a long period of time. And one of the big benefits we get out of this is we get to really focus and use our capacity effectively. Uh, rather than having to build multiple data centers or increase existing footprint, we can really focus in on optimizing our current capacity. And underpinning all of these is our security and resiliency. We want that for our infrastructure and our applications. So what does that mean for uh, in infrastructure as a service? We have uh, OpenStack clouds uh, deployed, and we want to uh, offer them as infrastructure as a service. So th th there's a quote here on, uh, on the slide that uh, is from one of our chief uh, IT architects, and he he's defining what programmable infrastructure is. Um, He's not asked me to put this in. This isn't a plug for him. And unfortunately, I'm not having to pay him to use it. Um, so I'm going to try and explain exactly what he's trying to get to. And what we're trying to do is interacting through the system. We're trying to re remove humans from being involved. We can know about it, but we shouldn't be involved in uh, delivering it. We want to have immediate change. We, we don't want to wait um, you know, minutes, hours, sometimes days, even weeks and years to actually have something available for someone. They should be able to deploy in seconds or less. And lastly, we really want to focus in on utilizing industry standard APIs, get away from proprietary uh, CLIs and GUIs. So what does that give us? What's, the, what's our benefit? So we're focused on programmable infrastructure. And as we work with our application teams for, for them to deploy cloud-native applications, we get a cloud-native environment, which gives us benefits for resiliency, uh, real-time analytics, auto-healing, auto-scaling. So here's uh, an overview of the kind of the organization we have within Cisco IT. Uh, so we're part of Global Infrastructure Services, and we have Data Center and Platform Services as our large organization. And that offers a portfolio of different services. Goes for storage, we have a middleware, we have a containers team. Um, the, the most important one here, from my perspective anyway, is compute. And our team deploys um, bare metal, which is the foundation for all, all of our different virtualized offerings. We have a virtual um, infrastructure available for traditional applications, for um, our non-cloudy applications. And then in the middle here, we have our private cloud, which is all based on OpenStack. 
And that's the focus for today. One thing just to add on about the future is we, have, um, we don't have the ability to provision uh, our applications through Cisco IT onto a uh, public cloud. We don't have the ability to burst today. There's something we're working on and something we want to get for our application teams as well. So to give you just a quick overview of how we've implemented OpenStack uh, within Cisco IT. So we first of all started um, in 2013, and we really wanted to get a, uh, an environment where application teams could try out OpenStack. So we created a POC environment, we termed it our express environment, and it, it was the proving ground for the applications. They embraced this, adopted it. Um, our foot hardware footprint uh, listed here started off very small, and it's grown up to today to be, to, to be quite large, and uh, we have a large hardware footprint. So as we went ahead and deployed OpenStack, we've made it available for our production applications, we provided high priority support, we put it into multiple data centers to meet the client's needs. And then up to uh, last year, we upgraded our clouds all the way up to Juno, and then we stopped. Uh, we've put them into maintenance mode now. Uh, we're not deploying any new features on those clouds. Instead, our strategy is to deploy new clouds, uh, utilizing the, the Metarca code base, and uh, really focusing on our software-defined networking we have available at Cisco. So we're looking to add new features there, um, and then make those available for our application teams. And then on into the future, we will we'll migrate our existing applications from Juno onto our new clouds um, that we'll have, and we'll take those clouds onto later versions, and we'll also look to expand to a more of a global footprint. So seeing here, this is the uh, locations of our current data centers. Uh, we have uh, around 3,600 VMs in our Allen, Texas data center. We have around 400 VMs in our Richardson data center, which is also in Texas. And we have about 1,000 VMs uh, in our Research Triangle Park, North Carolina um, data center. So that adds up to about 5,000 VMs or so. Uh, obviously, they change. It's, uh, applications grow and shrink their footprint uh, as needed. Uh, but we, we hover around 5,000 today. For the future, we're looking into uh, locations potentially to have a cloud in Amsterdam and into uh, Bangalore. It's, it's really, really depend on what our clients need. So you've seen a kind of potted history of where we are with OpenStack and our deployment. So we'll, let's move into how we actually deploy our OpenStack service. So I like to term this models, models, and more models. Um, we have, we're gonna cover four of our models today. Uh, we're gonna cover our operating model, how we internally operate our OpenStack teams. We have our offering model, what we present to our clients. Uh, we have our support model, how we support our platform and our clients. And lastly, uh, the, we have, which is very important, our cost model. How do we reclaim the money to be able to pay for this service? So the first is our operating model. Um, we run a DevOps organization. Uh, we have an OpenStack virtual team. Uh, it's under this umbrella here. We have four teams that, go f that, that work together to, uh, to work on a DevOps model. So let's, let's uh, take a look at this op, uh, ops model in more detail. It's obviously a bit of a complex diagram here, and I'm gonna take you through a few layers of it. So we first of all start with wh wh where do our requirements come from? So we start at the top from a client-driven perspective. We have a customer success team and some product managers who meet with clients and stakeholders and take their requirements. They then feed that down into the middle layer, which is our strategy layer, uh, so we can understand what our clients are needing. We then have a scrum structure uh, in our development layer. So these are our co-mingled uh, engineers and developers from our development team, our operations team, and our architecture and design team. And these will, will you know, assess what technology is, uh, is available, and they will feed those requirements and that information up to the middle strategy layer as well. Now, to de deploy our, the different features on our clouds, we've currently split into three scrum teams. We have a scrum team on cloud design, we have a scrum team on metrics, and enhancements, and we have a scrum team on monitoring and internal custom tooling. Now these teams, as I said, are, are they're commingled different resources. We don't want any siloing amongst our different, uh, different groups, uh, and they work towards developing uh, the features. Once the feature is developed, it's released into a, uh, through a release process, it goes into productions, clients can then consume it. But with that, the scrum doesn't then step out at that point and go on to something else. They'll still stay responsible for supporting that feature until we go through um, quite a detailed definition of done. Once that is uh, complete, then um, our operations teams can, can take it on fully, and the scrum teams can go back to, to, to uh, developing other features. 
So we have uh, also two extra scrums as well. Uh, we run all of our uh, OpenStack uh, work, whether it's process or technology or anything at all through different user stories, tasks, features and epics. We really want to focus in on that, um, that uh, agile model. So we have a platform breaks fix team, which focuses on short-term fixes, short-term changes. They don't interact with customers uh, and clients. Instead, they'll receive uh, requirements from, from our support organization to um, do any changes. If it's going to be a long-term change, then that is pushed across to one of the other Scrum teams, and they work on it instead. Uh, we also have a process um, Scrum as well, which focuses on making sure we keep our processes up to date, making sure all the documentation is done, whether it's end user facing or whether it's internal. We want to make sure we, st we still get that done and that doesn't get left behind. So we also have an organization layer for our scrums. We have scrum masters for ceremonies and we have a proxy product owner for each of our scrums. Uh, we don't want to hold back a, a, a scrum while they wait for their uh, any prioritization or any needed user stories. Instead, we want someone in that team to be able to know what the priorities are, make sure the needed user stories are created and uh, prioritized, and then once they're developed and completed, they can be accepted by the proxy product owner. So they get their direction from the kind of middle layer, which is uh, in there you'll see the chief product owner, uh, and that's me, so obviously the most important picture on, uh, piece on the slide. Um, so I um, set high-level strategy, I um, take all the different feedback and all the different requirements, and we, we set that, I can provide roadmaps to clients and stakeholders, uh, I can help prioritize things as needed, but I also make sure I feedback the general strategy, the general um, roadmap to the internal teams. There was feedback from those teams, they work in a scrum, they wanna know what's going on with the rest of the program, so we've gotta make sure that happens. So we do that, we, we keep external, but also our internal groups um, up to date. So we've got a, an internal organization that can go, help, go forward and develop features uh, on the platform. I want to go through just a brief overview of how we do a feature enablement and the process we go through to make sure we can deliver um, effectively. So we run a growth hacking um, kind of funnel approach. We take a lot of time identifying what our clients need and analyzing what they currently use and what we think they're going to use in the future. And then we'll, we'll get our kind of feature list, what, what we're going to enable. At that point, we don't just say, okay, you want X feature, come back and see us in six months and we'll have it ready for you. Instead, uh, we run something we call our minimum viable experiments. And that's taking um, early, uh, the feature, putting it into essentially a lab environment or an early view of it, work with the client to take their feedback and make sure it's going in the right direction if there's anything else they need. We can also, at the same time, utilize it to review our internal impact. If we're releasing a feature out, we've got to know that we are staffed and able to support it, make sure it's uh, what the impact it's going to have. So we can do that at that time, and that saves us not getting any surprises when a feature goes live. And once that's done, we'll then move into full development mode, and we will um, push, uh, push, uh, work towards a minimum viable um, product experience. So we want to get something out there, then iteratively add to it. So at that point, we can still continue to get feedback and make sure that we're going in the right direction. Our clients will have known about this because we'll have worked with them uh, about the feature, so they still will need some education, but it shouldn't be uh, a very long ramp up time. So that means we'll start to get our ROI in the last phase. Um, as you can see, the graph goes up uh, quite highly for, for client satisfaction because um, they'll know about it so they can start to use it. We'll, they won't have to spend a long time ramping up or learning about the feature. So because we spend a lot of time with our clients um, understanding what they need, uh, I wanted to give an overview of what was like our uh, customer feedback mechanisms. So the first thing we do uh, is spend a lot of time, as I said, talking to our clients, understanding what they use and what they need. Uh, we have a customer success team that meets uh, very regularly with our clients. We have a set cadence with them. Uh, our larger strategic clients, we, we tend to meet more often. Um, but we do meet when they need it and when they want it, and if they, a client wants to reach out for anything, they have a mechanism to engage us. From a, a kind of high-level program perspective, we have a, a quarterly webinar where we give to our clients and to our internal teams. We'll give them information about new features, about uh, the different um, things we're working on, our roadmap update, and we'll also provide training and overviews of the new features so clients are aware and they can potentially start to use it pretty, very quickly. We have a twice-yearly customer advisory board where we uh, meet with our uh, 
clients, it's a, it's a select group of clients, we can't meet with them all at the same time. And they, it's kind of a deeper dive into what they're working on, what they're expecting to use, what their future plans are, and then we can give our future plans and, 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 and work, make sure we're working towards this, the right direction. From an end user perspective, um, which is the day-to-day -day piece, we provide a lot of training, a lot of documentation um, out to our clients, uh, and we also have a regular um, email communication mechanism. We send updates about what's available, um, what's coming, um, if there's any maintenance required. Uh, also, unfortunately, we do have to communicate if there's any outages or any impact. We wanna make sure they're aware so they can react as needed. Uh, but we're also making sure that we close out issues. We let them know when something is fixed. Uh, there's a lot of feedback that clients, we're very quick to tell them something's broken, but we don't ever tell them we fixed it. So we make sure we do that. So a couple of uh, snapshots of our um, kind of training information, the documentation we provide our clients. We have an internal uh, community, which we uh, publish out some process information. It's, it's hosted on an internal system. We give them information about how the different processes work, things like funding and support. And we also provide them a lot of uh, training information. Our uh, clients can use a self-service model to set up their OpenStack projects uh, and then provision their infrastructure. So we wanna make sure that they understand how to use our self-service tooling. And we then give them some basic information about OpenStack. We don't, um, we want them to, if they're new to OpenStack, we give them brief information about how to set up kind of their first uh, VM or project. And that point, if they want to get more advanced, we don't recreate that information. Instead, we link them off to um, the, the, the community and the, the industry information, and they can use that. There, there was no point spending time and, um, uh, and effort um, recreating that great material. So that's how we staff uh, internally, the things we offer our clients, the engagement we have with our clients. Uh, ultimately, we're there as an infrastructure provider. We want to uh, provide them the, the needed resources for their applications. So when they come in, um, we want to give them different uh, support offering models. And basically that means there are certain things, so when they want to set up their infrastructure, how they can actually utilize some of the IT processes. So this has been a progression. When we first started, uh, we had self-managed um, as our first offering, uh, which was for our, kind of, uh, our Express, our POC clients. Then as production applications came on board, we offered an IT managed offering, which was more of the traditional what IT has previously done for infrastructure. But as times have changed, and we've moved forward onto really emphasizing programmability APIs and um, building that intelligence in, we've come up with our, our new offering model, which we call Managed Cloud. And this is really focused on programmability. So here's um, a comparison about what the three options cover, and I'm gonna give a, just a little bit of detail uh, about each one. So the, the least intrusive and the most open is our self-managed. IT just supports the platform at that point, and we provide the new features. The clients are responsible for uh, supporting their own uh, virtual machines, their own operating systems. They have freedom to do whatever they want. They have full access. They um, can in, uh, install any operating system that they choose, but they have some responsibilities. They are responsible for that VM, so they're responsible for security compliance. And then on the... Uh, Left-hand side here, we have our uh, IT managed, which is our most intrusive offering. And this is the much more traditional, uh, what we pro uh, provided from IT for the non-cloudy applications. IT provides full operational support and has full ownership for the virtual machines. This means we're responsible for all the compliance aspects, um, we'll support any issues, we'll own issues. The problem is it's the most intrusive. We, take, we don't allow root access to the VMs. We make them use very particular uh, IT-approved operating uh, system packages. We let them create their VMs, but they can't change the VMs at that point. They, they, uh, they have to engage IT to make any changes. With that push to programmability, though, that's, that's not working out for our clients anymore. They need to move away from those traditional um, support options, um, but they still need IT support. A lot of our uh, application teams are experts on their applications. They're not sysadmins. They uh, do need some help for virtual machines. So what we, what we do in this model is kind of a hybrid of the other two. We provide operational support, but we don't take ownership. Application teams own their virtual machines. They, own, they can do certain things. They have higher levels um, of access where they can, they can do things. Uh, they can use orchestration tools. And if there's an issue, they can engage support. But we don't actually own that issue. And that's a, big, that's a big important distinction now. We're trying to get our application teams to take some ownership. They're responsible for compliance. It's not IT having to um, do, do all the work for them. 
So that means we're, uh, as we move forward with our uh, global cloud strategy, we're deprecating our IT managed offering. We're not going to have that anymore for our clients. We are um, working towards just having uh, the, the client teams be able to use IT managed on our more traditional virtualized infrastructure. This means if they want it, they can have it, but they won't get the features that they may need and they get with OpenStack. And here's some of the uh, examples of some of the doc documentation we provide about our offering models. Uh, we want to give our client teams as, as much information as we can about the offering models, make it very clear what accountability is and what can be done in the models. Uh, we give them process flows so they can really understand what, what's going on, and what they need to do, and how they can engage the uh, IT. We do provide some guidelines about some of the cloud native architectures. They're only guidelines. We don't enforce them. But we want to try and give our client teams as much information as possible. The largest challenge we're going to have is with our traditional uh, IT clients that have been utilizing our infrastructure for a long time, they're kind of used to the IT managed support. They really want to use APIs. They really embrace cloud native. But they still kind of have some expectation on IT as well. Now, we're not just going to cut them off and say, OK, you're now managed cloud. We don't have to, we don't have to help you on this or take the ownership. So it's, it's a journey. It's a progression we're going with them. We're giving them a lot of education. But we're finding the more we do that, the more empowered they feel. And they're uh, really starting to adopt it. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Isfan, who's going to take you through the support model. Thanks very much, Rob. <clears throat> yes, let's look at the support model. So everything that Rob just explained means that we need to fundamentally change how we look at service support and service delivery. There is a shift from being the middleman between providing the infrastructure and the clients. Now we want to be simply the enabler, just the infrastructure provider without the middleman. That means that for um, for the client, all of this should be self-service. And we only provide platform support by default. That means we are abstracting ourselves from whatever is on top of, top of the platform. We give the responsibility to the client to build their application in a way that is uh, most working for them. So that means that if they smartly engineer their applications, um, they will they will probably be on the cheapest option because they will automatically uh, set, they will set up their applications to automatically uh, self heal if need to, upsize, downsize, or or change horizontally. Um, that means that uh, for both sides, the easiest if the clients uh, are engineering in a smart way, engineer uh, instead of over engineering, because if they over engineer, that's going to cost money for them. Also, if they don't adopt the cloud native application mindset, but they still want higher uh, SLA support, if they still want support, then they, they will have to pay extra for that. So that's, that's the change that now we are just simply the infrastructure uh, provider, instead of being a middleman to slow things down. Let's look at how exactly the engagement model looks uh, in terms of self-managed and uh, managed cloud. Um, so first of all, I want to highlight that it's always very important to make your end user facing instructions uh, as good as you can make it. Because uh, I, in my experience, I noticed that in many cases, service teams neglect it. They don't put enough effort in it. And, and the burden is going to be on your support teams. So if you put enough effort and then you make a very good user experience right on the top layer, which is, uh, which is the self-service pages, then you're going to save a lot of time and effort and, and uh, most importantly, money when it comes to support. Uh, Rob showed a couple of uh, example pages uh, that we have. On the self-managed side, all we do in tier one support is uh, supporting the provisioning tools, uh, nothing more. Uh, on the managed cloud side, there is more support. There is uh, break fix issues, there is uh, OS, uh, OS compliance help, helping with upgrading the uh, operating systems. So you get all that uh, support if you're on the managed cloud. You have multiple tiers. On tier one, we call a service operations center. And then we have solution groups on tier two. And there is also something else we call operating uh, or operation command center, which is there for those applications that are marked as P1 in terms of criticality. And they oversee and try to accelerate the resolution for those P1 applications. And then we come, when we come down or escalate up, depends on how you look at it, escalate up to uh, the platform support to tier three, that's where you have uh, 
the open your OpenStack operators, your OpenStack SMEs, and uh, that's, that's the platform level support. That brings us uh, to the one that is most important to me, uh, the, the cost models. Um, I'm going to explain four aspects. One is that how we look at our TCO and how we analyze the TCO. And uh, from there, we move on what is the user-facing price list, what's, what's uh, that the users see out of all, all, these, all these numbers. And then from there, we move on how we actually process uh, charges and how we do billing. And then I will uh, call out a couple of uh, challenges that we need to deal with. The number one thing for us is we are IT, we are a cost center, we are not here to make profit. We are here to enable uh, the rest of Cisco to create, uh, to, to make, create applications and r run them on our infrastructure for as cheap as possible. So what it means for me when I look at creating our pricing is that I need to understand absolutely 100% our TCO, all, all, the, all the cost drivers, and that's, that's the data that I will use to create our prices. And uh, now I'm, I'm working on a shift from what we have been doing up until now, and then we are going to change for the next, next fiscal year. But there's, I don't think there is an absolutely right or wrong way to do it. I've been to another session earlier this week, and I've seen another approach, which I didn't have any problem with, and that's what made me realize that there's not really a right or wrong way to do this. Uh, I, I just simply went looking at what, what are our fixed costs? We have data center, we have hypervisor and license, uh, other license costs. We have um, uh, foundational support, platform support, which, which I'm gonna put in the fixed bucket. And then there is the actual hardware resource that uh, uh, we, uh, we made these uh, unit costs for CPU and RAM, and that's going to be variable from the client perspective depending on uh, how much uh, infrastructure resource they use. And on top of that, uh, there is a cost to OS, a different OS, uh, different license prices, and then uh, they can also go uh, and uh, see this, 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 well, I need to go and see the, how much the support costs to us. And what they can see is here on the next slide, this is really the, the client perspective of it, which uh, I originally called the compute service menu, you can call it the compute service price list. The point here, it needs to be very simple and consumable from the client perspective, but at the same time reflect uh, what, what I find in our TCO and, and um, make sure that we collect all the money back we need for to cover for our expenses. So in terms of uh, open uh, OpenStack, there is going to be a set of flavors available and based on those flavors, there are going to be uh, prices. So client, let's say, would go buy, uh, I don't know, let's say two four by four VMs and, and uh, they could look at this uh, menu, which is pretty much like we have this sort of, uh, this is my association, that we have these sort of noodle bars in Europe, then you first pick the type of noodle, then you pick the sauce, then the meat, and so on. Uh, so for me, the noodle is the server here, that's the, that's the most important uh, base element in the pricing. And uh, on top of that, if, a new, if we are talking about a new VM, then uh, it's not going to be an additional cost, it's going to be a compliant uh, operating system on it. If the client uh, doesn't need any additional support, completely uh, self-managed, then again, not additional. I, I build all that cost into that OpenStack flavor price. However, if we are talking about a VM that is already been out there for, for a while now and um, operating system might be out of compliance, then we are, then we are building in a, a penalty charge for that. Also, if they opt in for managed cloud, uh, or, or even additional support, then it's going to be uh, more money for them, depending on how much we are spending on those support teams. And uh, if we are smart enough, we can build in the hidden cost for our Ferrari in that, but that's not something I do. Uh, yeah, yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not planning to do it. Um, storage cost. Uh, from me, so Rob explained that we are the compute team, so storage for us is it's not us, we just ask the storage team, hey, what are your prices, and we, we build it in our uh, price list, and they have their own TCO, they come up with their own price. And there are uh, three different offerings. Uh, how do we process collections and billings? Uh, basically, we just monthly check uh, the active VMs, we associate the price, but then what's very interesting for us is, 
uh, that we have some central IT funding for the service, which means that we must provide infrastructure to a certain extent for free in Cisco. And uh, only when we cannot fund something, but we need to be able to fulfill the demand, that's when we actually charge. In the centrally funded element, um, we still do something we call showback. So every, every time that uh, we are doing this uh, absorbed cost, there's always, to every service consumer, we, uh, we show how much we are absorbing on their behalf. And they need to report up about that because uh, higher level management, our CIO, will look at it and they will say that, I know that it's not your cost, but you're causing, you're causing this much to the compute service, so I still hold you responsible to try to push it down. But it is still a difference from actually charging the department. Um, and then if, if something is out of central fund, th then we actually do the charges. Which brings us, sorry, wrong way. Which brings us to the first biggest challenge I have when I look at uh, our collection processes and uh, our pricing and billing. Is that how do I, how do I identify and how, how do I uh, create differentiation between what I'm gonna offer for free and what is going to be actually charged for? And what we have been doing in the past for long is that we, we just dollarized everything, that every, every offering we, we checked how much it cost and then we know our IT funding. And then up until that point it's going to be free to the client, above that we'll charge for it. But we had, we had uh, various issues with that and we started to think about maybe a better idea is to do something like we call a capacity model, which is more like a, uh, like a data plan for your um, mobile services that to, to a certain amount of CPU usage and RAM usage, you, you, get, uh, you get your infrastructure for free and then you pay above that. You can also differentiate between that the infrastructure element will be free but the support will be charged on top of it and so on. So this is still not completely decided for us for the next year how we're going to uh, do the differentiation. And the other factor is that if we really go with just simply pricing out the exact cost, then we're going to run into a, uh, an issue that, wait, today OpenStack is new, it's new technology, we are investing so much uh, money on it. Today it's just more expensive for us than our traditional, than running our traditional VMware environment, for example. And if we want to reach that economies of scale, then we need to think about incentivization um, strategies, which is going to probably impact our pricing strategy. Because maybe we want to say that, okay, let's inflate the old infrastructure and then put price down on the new one or say that uh, cer certain size of VMs on OpenStack is going to be free, or infrastructure element is, support isn't. That's something that I don't have a Cisco way defined right now, because uh, we're still in discussions. And a third one, uh, which I think compared to the previous is a bit smaller issue, but still a challenge, uh, is that today we are running OpenStack on Blades and on Rack Mount as well. And obviously, cost-wise, that's, that's the difference. Uh, but I don't want to introduce that complexity on the price list that, hey, if you're on Blade, then you pay differently than if you were on Rackmount. Also, it may not even be your choice. So uh, that's another thing that somehow we need to solve. So that brings us to the end of uh, the models and uh, to ACC, which, is, um, which I'm going to do a little bit of a demo in a second. Just wanted to explain that Again, we're all about self-service in this uh, new IS approach. So we, we provide OpenStack Horizon to the clients to create and manage their VMs. We provide the APIs to the infrastructure so, they can, so the applications can directly interact with the infrastructure, but we still need something else that is very specific to us in Cisco. Uh, whatever we need, we have uh, rigid service mapping requirements, there's financial approval processes, and then we need to make sure that all applications are registered in our application portfolio. Um, so we have ACC that brings all these models together that uh, Rob and I explained. Um, and I think right now I'm just gonna jump into ACC and, and uh, show how it works for us. So if all goes well, I think, uh, I'm not a Mac user. <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna come here, right? There you go. Um, the client can come here, this is uh, the landing page, uh, can click on register and then simply put in the application name here, which I'm gonna do OSS 2017 for now. 
and uh, they need to pick their tenant, or in other terms, the, the service category, because as I said, uh, we, we make sure that every application is mapped to a service. We do uh, TCO calculations on the service level, so if a cost uh, occurs for this application that needs to be somehow mapped back to a service. So let's say I'm gonna pick um, employee experience and collaboration, and let's say email and calendaring. Um, what I'm doing here is really uh, not, it's not gonna make any impact on the infrastructure. This is really just for registering an application. And the go-live date can be uh, as early as today. Uh, and uh, what is really important for us is to, to add the funding requirement for it. So let's say the application uh, team or the developer here says that, oh no, maybe this will go up till uh, 10,000. And this is the money I'd like to ask from my, from my financial analyst. And then, this is really just a quota. So if the financial analyst approves, which I cannot demo here, because we didn't prepare uh, to bring our FA, our financial manager here, I'm just gonna open up uh, an application um, that, uh, that is already approved. But once it's approved, then that, uh, and if we go with the 10,000 example, it means that uh, uh, that's what's available uh, for this application, but uh, if you don't use it, you don't use it. Uh, here there are four profiles defined. Uh, I'll, I'll say uh, pick this one, which I created for the Cisco Live demo in Berlin a couple of months ago, which runs in Richardson and um, self-managed. And the profile itself doesn't run anything, but here this instant is actually running in that data center, which is a two by four PM. And uh, if you if you want add, ACC simply tells you to go go to Horizon and start adding your VMs or you can just do it through APIs, and every change you make to this profile, you create more applications, you resize them, you change them, it's gonna show up here and it's gonna have an impact on your budget as well. Um, so I realize uh, that we only have four minutes and we need to uh, let, give some time to questions, but it's not an issue because that was the end of the presentation. How do I go back to the slide here, right? Yeah. There's, there's a small conclusion here. Um, that is simply about, since industry and future is going uh, to cloud native, and that's our Cisco uh, global cloud strategy as well, we need to make sure that we embrace it and our application teams embrace it too. We need to think uh, again about how we do service delivery because what fundamentally we are changing the service. Um, DevOps is critically important to be able to deploy uh, iteratively new and new, uh, uh, new and new iterations of the technology. And of course, user experience must be uh, in the center of everything when it needs to be uh, simple and um, it's still a challenge for us as well at Cisco. And then I'll open it up to questions. Thanks very much. And uh, if you have any questions, please use the microphones on the side. So uh, are you also leveraging Cisco ACI for the net networking piece? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, that's what our new, uh, the new Metallica clouds that we're working on are, are going to be fun uh, functioning on, yes. So it's OpenStack and Cisco ACI together? Yes, yes it will be, yes. And yeah. the user interface that you were showing for the, for the demo, so behind the scenes it's, it's talking with OpenStack APIs? Yes, we use uh, StackStorm currently to do the interaction with the, with the, ACI, uh, the OpenStack uh, APIs. Okay, thanks. Do you have a ballpark of the headcount you have supporting this um, service level you have? Um, so I would say, um, are you talking about, sorry, to clarify, are you asking about um, pl there's like platform operators, development, which, which, which kind of team are you, are you thinking of? Any, everything? Or? Kind of everything uh, to support your models. So, I mean, for everything, I would say we have around uh, about 20 people probably um, assigned to it, and we split them up between design, development and our operators that are focused on the open step platform. So it's around 20 people, so. Thank you. If no more questions, then thanks very much for attending. Thank you, everybody.